We found early time restricted eating had no negative effects on muscle mass. And this was really important because the largest study previous or prior to ours found that time restricted eating when practiced by skipping breakfast actually negatively affects muscle mass. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In today's episode, we reconnect with Courtney Peterson, PhD, to talk about a brand new study of hers published in JAMA, a 14-week study comparing two groups. Both were calorie restricted, but while one was eating over 12 or more hours per day, the other was eating in less than eight hours. So essentially, looking at whether shortening our eating window and starting that eating window early in the day leads to benefits with regards to weight loss and other cardiometabolic risk factors over and beyond standard calorie restriction. We also talk about some of Courtney's research looking at night shift workers and meal timing and time-restricted eating as a potential tool during cancer treatment. As always, all references are included in the show notes. And if you want to watch this, you can do so on YouTube, where full-length videos of each episode of The Proof can be found. Please do enjoy. This is me and Courtney Peterson, PhD. Hey, Courtney. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Yes, the the regular listeners will uh, remember you from episode 204, which was a, a few months ago now when you came on with Emily Manugian and, and walked us through uh, some of the important things to consider when evaluating uh, research looking at time-restricted eating and, and, and what we can and, and perhaps cannot say from the various studies that, that have been performed to date. And the reason for having you back on the show today is to primarily discuss a new study that your group published in JAMA. I have that study in front of me. I thought it would be a, a good idea to get you on to discuss mm -hmm. the kind of rationale for the study and, and the study design that you used and, and what you found. Yes. Um, so why don't we jump straight into that? And then uh, after that, if we have some time, I'd like to, to also kind of pick your brain a little bit on some of the work that you've, you've done looking at time-restricted eating and night shift workers and, and possibly mm -hmm. cancer if we, if we have the space. So let's start with this, this new randomized controlled trial of yours that was mm -hmm. published in JAMA. Tell us about the, the question or the questions that you were interested in exploring with this study and and then we can walk through the study design that you sort of use to answer these? Sure. So we were interested in the broader question, does time-restricted eating, which is a form of daily intermittent fasting where you effectively extend the fasting duration so you can... Um, you're fasting for a longer period each day, can, can that actually help people lose weight, right? So if you're an adult with obesity or you're overweight, can you use time-restricted eating to lose more weight? Um, or is it better to eat your meals kind of spaced throughout the day? So in our particular study, we were interested in testing something called early time-restricted eating. So these are approaches where you eat and say, um, you eat in the early part of the day, and you typically finish eating dinner in the mid-afternoon, and then you fast for the rest of the day. And in our particular study, we had participants eat over about an eight hour period early in the day and then they fasted for 16 hours a day. So for your listeners who are used to some of the terminology in the field, we, we might call this a 16-8 diet. 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. And we were interested in whether this is a better approach for losing weight than what the standard um, person um, would do. So at least in the United States, if you look at data from NHANES, which is the largest nutritional uh, assessment, uh, that's looked at meal timing patterns. The median American eats over about a 12 hour period mm -hmm. and so has about 12 hours of fasting. So we were curious, you know, is it better to eat over an eight hour period early in the day or is it better to eat over a 12 hour period in the day? What's better for weight loss, for improving cardiometabolic health, for improving sleep, mm -hmm. and for improving mood? Mm -hmm. And this was kind of done in conjunction with what standard practice would be for weight loss. You sort of alluded to that, but maybe maybe walk right. through what that looks like. So if someone does 
go and, and see their physician and, and goes on a, a standard kind of energy restriction style diet. Mm-hmm. Um, what what does that look like? And 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 in this study, what did that look like? Because yeah. um, that was a part of both groups. So maybe we kind of break that down a little bit. Sure. So we, in our study, participants enrolled in a weight loss program through our hospital. And what that consisted of was advice to cut calories by about 500 calories per day Mm -hmm. below their resting metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. In our study, we actually even measured their resting metabolic rate so we'd get that dietary prescription correct. And then they got counseling for how to do that. So they met with a registered dietitian about once a month, every month throughout the study. And then they were also counseled to increase their physical activity and to exercise. Depending on whether they were sedentary or not, they received counseling to increase their exercise to at least 15 minutes a day if they did no exercise or at least 30 minutes a day if they did exercise. So, so counseling to, to help them reduce their caloric intake by about 500 calories a day. So for most subjects in this study... What did that look like? Were they, were they, I'm just trying to think of a, a day in the life yes. of someone in this study, right? Yes. Were they actually, yeah. they had a certain um, calorie target that they were given from the dietitian, um, which was sort of 500 calories below what their body required for say maintenance, I assume. And then mm-hmm. they, were, they were reading labels and counting their calories throughout the day to try and hit that target. Correct, exactly. So this is a pretty standard weight loss mm-hmm. program. Right, and so- this study is really interesting because that's what all participants were doing, but Correct. half of them did that across yeah. 12 or more hours a day. So not even thinking mm-hmm. about what hours am I doing this in, just wake up and count calories. And then the other half were also doing that, but they were mm-hmm. eating in this early time-restricted eating window. Is that right? That's correct. And those the participants who were in the early time-restricted eating um, part of the study, they had to eat their meals between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m., which is 1,500 hours. So we didn't give flexibility in this particular study. It was the same times for everyone, but we have other studies where we adjust that eating window relative Mm -hmm. to when people wake up and go to sleep. Yeah, I'm interested when we get to the results to chat about adherence. Um, Mm -hmm. Cool. So... Tell me a little bit more about the actual subjects. So these were subjects that were overweight or were they classified as, as being obese, predominantly male or female? How old were these subjects? Mm-hmm. So on average, our participants were about 43 years old, but most of them are kind of in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And about 80% of our participants are women. (laughs) I think women are more likely to enroll in weight loss uh, programs. And the remainder uh, were men. Mm -hmm. And and on average, coming into our study, most participants were eating over about a 12 to 13 hour window when they first enrolled in the study. Mm -hmm. That's that's great though, because one of the, I guess, um, questions I get quite often when talking about various mm-hmm. time restricted eating studies or fasting in general is mm-hmm. you know were there women involved in these studies or was it just a cohort with with all men and and therefore can we extrapolate those findings to females so um, that's that's interesting to know um, and something else regarding these kind of subjects at baseline and this ties into our earlier conversation you mentioned last episode that you are of the belief, um, at least this is how I, I heard it, that time-restricted eating can be helpful for blood glucose regulation, particularly for someone who has impaired blood glucose regulation. So someone that has prediabetes or, or diabetes, it seems like that's where it would be most useful. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I'm, I'm curious yes. as to what, what was the kind of baseline um, blood, glu- blood glucose control like in these subjects? Sure, absolutely. So the, the average participant in our study had prediabetes and prehypertension. Mm. So um, they were over about 100 milligrams per deciliter uh, in terms of their glucose levels. So, and on average, they had a BMI of around 40. So all of our patients had obesity. They had varying degrees. Um, 
the heaviest participant in our trial had a BMI of about 60, but our range was 30 to 60. So pretty wide range, but all people who struggled to lose weight. Okay. And this was 14 weeks, the study? Correct. It's a 14 week long study. Mm -hmm. So what we did at the start of the study is we were very intentional. We wanted to ask a very clear, rigorous question. Are there any extra benefits? Does intermittent fasting help you lose weight? So we wanted to match all parts of the study across groups. So the only thing that was different was the time of day that participants ate. Mm -hmm. Um, And the interesting thing we did in the study, this particular study, is we said you need to follow the program six days a week on average. So they got one break day a week, which I think is really important because one of the things we've been thinking about is intermittent fasting shouldn't be an all or nothing thing, right? If we we said you had to do intermittent fasting every day, no one would want to do that, right? Because everyone wants to have a social life. And so we gave them one day a week and they got to pick what day of the week Mm -hmm. they could go off the program and hang out with friends. Yeah, I think that's important. You can then kind of survey your uh, social calendar and on, on a weekly yes. basis sort of work out when you, when you have that dinner yeah. engagement or, yeah. or date night yeah. or something. Um, mm-hmm. Before we get into the results, what were the, the main outcomes of interest? So what were you most interested in, in kind of measuring to see if there was a difference between groups? So we had two what are called co-primary outcomes, but two sort of equally important Uh, things that we were looking at. One is weight loss and the other is fat loss. And we looked at fat loss in two ways. One is the conventional way. What's the total amount of body fat that someone's lost? The other one, which was not so conventional, but I thought was really neat, was to look at the ratio of fat loss to loss of total weight. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we wanted to look at that ratio is there was some data in rodents and also in humans suggesting that intermittent fasting may help you selectively burn fat and conversely, retain lean muscle, right? And so we wanted to test this hypothesis in in Mm. our study. And we had previously found that if you put patients in a respiratory chamber and they do early time-restricted eating, they actually burn more fat uh, Mm. over a 24-hour period. And we saw this sort of 12-hour period at nighttime where they're burning considerably more fat um, than they would otherwise. And so we thought, well, this is fantastic. One of the reasons why we did this study is we found that difference in fat burning in our previous studies, and we thought, wow, this could help people potentially burn more fat. Let's put that to the test and let's see if there's any sort of like selective or special effect, right? You see a lot of people on YouTube saying, I got shredded with intermittent fasting. So we wanted to see whether that was actually true. Yeah. That, that the point about lean muscle sort of preservation is interesting, though, because I think that might be counterintuitive. I think most people mm-hmm. would assume if you're limiting your eating window and therefore, um, restricting the time in which you're ingesting protein that might Correct. impair your um, okay. your lean muscle yeah. mass. So okay. it'd be interesting to see what you you saw there. Um, so they were the primary outcomes, and then what were the other things mm-hmm. that you were you were measuring that you were interested in? Yeah. So uh, we were also interested in seeing how it affected their what we call cardiometabolic health. So these are their risk factors for diabetes. So your blood sugar control. So we looked at fasting blood sugar. We looked at fasting insulin levels and then something called HOMA IR, which estimates how insulin or resistant or sensitive someone is. And the way I like to describe insulin sensitivity is it's how good of a job can insulin do moving sugar out of your bloodstream and into your cells. So, it's, And we know that insulin problems with insulin sensitivity are basically precursors to type 2 diabetes. Uh, we also looked at blood pressure, which is pretty typical cardiovascular risk factor, cholesterol level, uh, triglyceride levels, and uh, heart rate. Um, and then we had a bunch of other things we were looking at uh, all across the spectrum, appetite, mood, quality of life, sleep, and so forth. With regards to body fat, did you um, break that down I guess when we consider, say, metabolic mm-hmm. health, often we think about where is yes. someone storing their fat? Is it subcutaneous adipose tissue, yes. which uh, I guess, relatively speaking, is a little bit more benign with regards to metabolic health as opposed to the visceral fat, so fat around the liver, which can contribute yes. to insulin resistance um, and that sort of mm-hmm. uh, poor blood glucose control. Did you, did you break down the, the sort of compartments of fat? We did, and we um, we looked specifically at visceral fat, what's called android fat. So that's the 
the fat you st- store in your abdomen that a lot of men can c- complain about. And then we also looked at gynoid fat, which is that thigh fat that a lot of women complain about. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tell us what you found. What yeah. were the, what were the yeah. most, I guess, the, the, the most significant results that you found? Let's start there and then we can dive into some of the other things. Yeah. Awesome. So we ended up finding that participants lost more weight when they did early time restricted eating. So they lost um, an extra 2.3 kilograms over the 14 week program. We did some very cool mathematical modeling to figure out what's the calorie equivalent, what sort of calorie deficit is that equivalent to? And we calculated back calculated that that's equivalent to cutting your calories by an extra 214 calories per day. Mm -hmm. Um, so pretty decent effect, not massive. Um, but what I would consider a quite important effect for, for weight loss. And this is, I think, quite interesting because other studies have put that estimate at anywhere from 125 calories to 500 calories. (laughs) And the numbers are kind of all over the board and our data suggests it's about a 200 calorie a day, uh, uh, advantage that you get. Um, we also found greater fat loss with early time restricted eating. And we found early time restricted eating had no negative effects on muscle mass. And this was really important because the largest study previous or prior to ours found that time restricted eating when practiced by skipping breakfast actually negatively affects muscle mass. Uh, There was a slight, I don't know if you remember, there was another uh, article that came out in JAMA, JAMA Internal Medicine two years ago, and they had participants skip breakfast and start eating around 12 p.m. Mm-hmm. And they found that uh, they lost, it was only a slight amount more muscle mass, but they lost uh, statistically significantly more uh, lean mass. Uh, and we found no evidence of that absolutely whatsoever. Mm-hmm. There wasn't even a hint of that. One of the things that was important about our studies is we counseled participants to eat the same food in both groups, right? And it's possible in the other study they didn't, you know, it's hard to know. They didn't, the other study didn't measure what participants ate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a really important finding, greater weight loss with no negative effects on muscle mass. But we didn't find any evidence for selective fat loss or indicating that there was any sort of special effect that selectively pre- preserved muscle per se. And, you know, we didn't find at least evidence of any big effect for fat burning and preserving muscle. Um, there was smaller effects. Or, or said another way, the extra, when, whenever you lose weight, roughly on average, so say you lose a pound of weight, roughly about 75% of that's fat. And the other 25% is muscle. So we were trying to kind of boost that. Can we bring that 75% to 85%? And we found no evidence of that. It was the same proportion of total weight lost as that. I just want to clarify a few things. Um, and then let's continue on to some of the other things that you, you measured. Yes. Um, so you said the, the early time restricted eating group on average lost 2.3 kilograms more body weight, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think from memory reading this, the, the paper, was it about six kilograms of, of total body weight lost in that time-restricted eating group and three point something or around four for the, the group that, that wasn't restricting their eating window? That's correct. Right. So this is over 14 weeks. So, that, so both groups lost quite a, a, a decent amount of weight, um, but there was that 2.3 kilogram, I guess, um, advantage to restricting the the eating window, which you said you sort of um, back calculated to be equivalent to consuming around 200, 214 or something calories less per day. Um, So a couple of questions here. One, did participants in that early time restricted eating arm of the study who ate on average 200 or so calories less a day, did they report more difficulty in actually doing this? And was there any difference in adherence? Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit of a difference in adherence, but it wasn't as big as what you thought. To be honest, when I started this study, we hypothesized people would stick with it five days a week and we decided we'd be thrilled with it if people did, right? Because in the long term, we have social obligations. We all have crazy busy lives. Um, But we found on average participants in both groups stuck with their programs at least six days a week on average. It was slightly higher in the control group. They stuck with their program 6.4 days a week, where it was only about six days a week in the early time restricted eating group. And that was a statistically significant difference. But in terms of the size of that adherence difference, it wasn't huge per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess where, where I was thinking was, okay, this was intense 
14 weeks, what was the mindset of these people at the end? Were, were all of the yeah. ones doing the, the early time restricted eating thankful to be out of the study and they were just going to re- <laughs> revert back to their standard way of, of eating? And, and what, you know, would we see these differences over 12 months, for example? Do, do you have any thoughts yeah. about yeah. that? Yeah. I don't know whether we'd see the same difference at 12 months. And I will say there are at least a couple large scale clinical trials on other forms of intermittent fasting where they find adherence just goes down with time and you lose any sort of weight loss advantage. And our study was super interesting. We asked participants when they got to the end of the study, do you want to continue on your current meal timing approach? If you don't, what do you want to do instead? The really interesting thing is the control group about 75% wanted to continue eating over a 12 hour or longer period. And only about a quarter wanted to try intermittent fasting in some shape Mm -hmm. or form. In the early time restricted eating group, about 42% wanted to continue doing early time restricted eating in some shape Mm -hmm. or form, where about two thirds wanted to stick with the original schedule. And the other one third wanted to modify it either by moving it slightly earlier in the day or by moving it slightly later in the day. Yeah. And that was, this brings up an important point. If someone didn't catch our last episode uh, mm-hmm. and they're thinking, wow, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., that's, that's an odd choice for the eating window. Correct. Um, rem- remind, us what, remind us why the early time-restricted eating window was chosen as opposed to, you know, Absolutely. I think that a lot of people that are doing an eight-hour window are doing uh, midday to 8 p.m., which I guess is considered yeah. late um, time-restricted eating. Maybe we, we should rebrand that to social time-restricted eating because <laughs> it allows you to yeah. still have dinner with your friends. Um, yes. But why the choice of early time-restricted eating in this study? And do you think yeah. if someone's listening and thinking, okay, I could do the eight-hour thing, but I'd prefer to do it later in the day, uh, would there still be an advantage to doing that over just eating mm-hmm. over, say, 12-plus hours a day? Yeah, great question. The literature is so fascinating here. So dating back about 50 years ago, when they were first working out the properties of these blood sugar tests, they found that if they administered these blood sugar tests called oral glucose tolerance tests in the morning, people's blood sugar levels were much better controlled. Whereas if they gave the same tests in the evening, their blood sugar levels spiked significantly higher. And lots of groups around the world got the same results. So in most people, we know you have your best blood sugar control in the morning. And even as you get to the afternoon and definitely in the evening, your glycemic or blood sugar control is significantly worse. Um, This has been tested in a lot of different ways. Even if you take out cells of someone's fat tissue and you culture them in a Petri dish and you measure what time of day those cells are best able to metabolize glucose, you get a time about mid-morning around noontime. Regardless of the type of study, the type of approach, you can also infuse people, infuse glucose through an IV through people, and you'll come to the same conclusion. Now, there are, there are exceptions potentially for shift workers where this is not true and for individuals, people with type 2 diabetes, and we, we can revisit those topics if those are interesting. But by and large, most people have their best blood sugar control early in the day. Mm. And so... Um, Studies have shown and give a lot of credit to Daniela Jacobowitz and Oren Freud in Israel. They did some really elegant studies in the last decade where they brought people in uh, to their clinic and they'd test what would happen if you ate a large breakfast, uh, medium sized lunch, and small dinner, or eat the same meals in the opposite order. And they found that if you front load calories early in the day, you actually reduce mean 24 hour blood sugar levels. You actually make blood sugar levels lower just by timing more of that caloric intake to the kind of sweet spot during the day when your blood sugar metabolism is at its highest. Do you, I just had a thought. Do you think that the timing of your meals, given what you're saying mm-hmm. now and, and how the body yes. can respond differently to similar food being eaten at different times over the day, I'm interested, we, we mentioned earlier visceral fat, and I think there's, you know, there's, from my read on the data, there's, there's a lot of reasons that could um, make someone more susceptible to storing visceral fat mm-hmm. and, you know, genetics plays a big part of that. And we see that with Asian populations, for example, some people can store more subcutaneous fat, it seems. They have like a higher threshold before it spills over. Mm-hmm. I've seen various studies looking at like sleep deprivation. If you deprive mm-hmm. someone of sleep, um, mm-hmm. that might make them more susceptible to, to increasing visceral mm-hmm. fat. Do you think there is it possible, 
if you're eating sort of out of alignment with your circadian rhythms, that could change fat storage sort of me- mechanics and, and where we're actually laying down fat? Yeah, absolutely. Two really cool studies in the past year um, have tested exactly that question. They actually had people eat in either an eight-hour window or a 10-hour window either early in the day or late in the day. And both of those two studies put people in what we call a metabolic or respiratory chamber where we measure how much fat that they burn throughout the day as well well as how many calories they burn. And both of those studies found that when people skipped breakfast and then ate within the same eating window or same length of the eating window later in the day, um, what we call fat oxidation or fat burning was impaired. So uh, their body did not burn as much fat. So there's a lot of things that kind of line up suggesting our metabolism is, metabolism is fine-tuned uh, to be most active in the morning. And I'll give you one more example. There's something called the thermic effect of food, which is how many calories you burn in digesting and metabolizing your food, and that's actually a little bit higher in the morning than in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. So you burn slightly more calories when you eat early in the day. It's not a huge effect. So okay. um, we think most of the benefit from eating early in the day actually um, is due to not burning more calories, but actually due to the fact that it suppresses your appetite. I can talk a little bit about the data there because it's it's quite cool. Yeah, let's 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 go into that. I do have one question first. You you started the eating window at seven a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, is was there a kind of rationale for seven a.m.? Was that based on when the average person was was waking up? And if if someone's listening and yeah. thinking, um, you know, maybe they don't wake up that early. Maybe they wake up a bit later. What's the key thing here? Is it is it starting your eating window say after an hour of waking up or after two hours or eating yeah. straight away? Do we have any mm-hmm. sort of idea as to what would be optimal there from a, a blood glucose control point of view? Yeah, we don't have a super clear picture. There's some hints, but um, studies where they infuse glucose or blood or sugar into someone's bloodstream indicate any time between like six and ten is fine for starting okay. breakfast. You'll hear a lot of other researchers talk about the fact that cortisol is elevated in the morning, which is absolutely true, and we know cortisol acutely worsens your blood sugar control. But there are other things at that time of the day that are already maximally activated. For instance, your pancreas is primed to produce insulin at that time of day. So that kind of outweighs the fact, the negative effects from cortisol being higher that time of day. Okay. So it's not going to be damaging if you're racing off in the morning and, and have to slam, slam down a breakfast within an hour of waking up. That's right. Now, there may be some subtleties there because some people have a a genetic variant of one of the melatonin receptors, which means their melatonin levels stay elevated for longer. And we know melatonin also acutely raises your blood sugar levels. So in some people, it may be better to wait a couple hours a little later until those melatonin levels fall more precipitously. How would someone know that? Would it, would it just be sort of understanding if you feel drowsy? It's probably not the, <laughs> yeah. the best time to be having breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Aside from getting genetic testing, probably if you're, if you're drowsy or if you just notice like a, a rapid r- blood sugar, you know, increase, you know, wait, wait a couple hours. The other thing you can do is try to get some bright light exposure first thing in the mm-hmm. morning because that'll drop your cortisol levels as well as your melatonin levels. Oh, that's a great tip. Um, okay, you were talking about appetite and I sort of derailed the conversation there. So let's come back to that. Awesome. So there are a number of studies that show if you eat more of your calories earlier in the day, it lowers the ap- your appetite. So one of the studies had people eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. And they found throughout the waking day, most of the waking day, appetite levels were lower, despite the fact that participants were eating the same total number of calories. Um, in my one of my clinical trials, we um, we also measured appetite hormones. We measured ghrelin, which is an acute hunger hormone. So this is a, a hormone that makes you just like hungry in the moment. Um, and we found ghrelin levels were lower at the end of the fast, which was kind of the opposite of what we were expecting. We thought at the end of an eighteen hour fast, people would be quite hungry, mm. but we found just favorable improvements in a bunch of appetite hormones, also including PYY, which is a satiety hormone. We found that was better activated in the evening. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because I guess from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, um, yeah. I, I would have thought consuming less calories and restricting your eating window would 
increase the the hormones that would stimulate appetite to get you out looking for calories. Right. Um, right. Interesting. Let's come back to the study. So uh, you mentioned there there was greater weight loss of that two point three mm-hmm. kilograms in the early time restricted eating group. Now I'm not sure if this was um, misreported or if this was actually one of the findings in the study. Um, but am I right that at least in the 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 main group of subjects, there wasn't a significant difference in fat loss? And if 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 that's right, what what explains the significant difference in weight loss but not fat loss? Yeah, it was mostly fat loss. It was mostly fat mass. So it was the same proportion of weight of fat loss and muscle loss as in the control group. It was just a greater total amount. Okay. And the cardiometabolic um, outcomes. So I think one that one that sort of stuck out to me was blood pressure. So you saw That's some correct. some quite interesting findings there. Correct. So we found that early time restricted eating was more effective for lowering diastolic blood pressure. Our results for systolic blood pressure were the same in magnitude. They just didn't quite reach statistical significance because there was more variability in that endpoint. Um, in this particular study, we found no improvements in fasting glucose or fasting mm-hmm. insulin. Um, hard to know exactly why that is. We have followed that up with what's called a per protocol analysis. These are analyses where you look at just the participants who actually stick with the program. And in that per protocol analysis, we do find that early time restricted eating improves glucose levels and insulin resistance. Uh, okay. We just didn't find that in the, ma- the main study. And then we wow. found no effects on lipids, which, are, which is consistent with all the other studies that, well, all the studies that we've done in our lab, as well as most other studies out there. We don't think there are any profound effects on, on cholesterol or triglycerides unless people are losing weight um, per se. Okay, that blood pressure one is is quite interesting. I'm sure there are people listening who who have elevated uh, blood pressure and have been told to to kind of change their their lifestyle. So that's that's an interesting finding and and perhaps something for for such people to to explore. Um, and I was I was interested in your dis- in the discussion you mentioned, or maybe it was in the results that the mm-hmm. magnitude, so the 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 reduction in blood pressure was similar to what you would see if someone adopted a dash diet or was doing endurance exercise. That's correct. So we saw a four point drop in diastolic blood pressure, which may not sound large, but for context, these were not individuals who had most of our patients didn't have hypertension, right? Mm-hmm. So they already had blood pressures around one, I think it was 124 (laughs) at baseline. I can't remember exactly off my top of my head, but given that their blood pressure was already, you know, decent and not super high, this is actually quite a decent change. And it's similar to what we've observed for the DASH diet, which is the leading diet that's currently recommended for treating hypertension and um, high blood pressure. What would it take, do you think, or is it already in the sort of hypertension cardiovascular guidelines? Do you think there's there's mm-hmm. more research required for this to be added sort of alongside DASH as, a, as another potential tool? Yeah, yeah I, I think more research is needed. We did another study where we also where we found a 10-point drop in blood pressure, but it was a better controlled study. And there have been about, I would say, about three other studies that have found improvements in blood pressure. Improvements in blood pressure are fascinating because we don't yet know whether they're due to the time of day people are eating, you know, early versus late in the day, or whether it's due to the extra fasting duration. And what's quite interesting is there's a bunch of research in the 1970s that showed if people fast for two to three days, there's a particular mechanism called fasting naturesis, which basically means like fasting induced um, extra excretion of sodium from the body, which in turn lowers blood pressure. But no one knows, do you get that same benefit from shorter duration fasts? So mm-hmm. one theory is we might have seen these benefits just solely due to the longer fasting duration. But there's other data suggesting that if you eat earlier in the day, regardless of your fasting duration, your body can also just get rid of excess sodium, that there are also mm-hmm. changes in sympathetic tone, which may effectively relax your blood vessels and also reduce blood pressure. So we have no idea what the mechanisms are or what's driving this, but there's some really cool data out there suggesting that all of this makes sense, um, that you would get a benefit from the early time restricted eating. Is it is it possible that some of that 
that blood pressure improvement is driven by the the difference in in body weight change or did your analysis yeah. su- suggest that it's the magnitude of of reduction there is such that it can't be purely driven by weight loss mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. I don't remember if this made it into the final manuscript, but we did do some statistical analyses to adjust for weight loss to basically ask the question, were these, was this extra benefit in diastolic blood pressure due to weight loss? And the answer was most of it was not due to the extra weight loss. Okay. Interesting. Any, any adverse effects? You know, some, sometimes a common question I get uh, yeah. from folks is, you know, is, is time-restricted eating or, or is it intermittent fasting? Is it, face, is it safe? Are there any kind of downsides? We didn't see any major side effects in this study other than what participants called, um, you know, like hunger um, or malaise. But we've done other studies where some participants have reported they were more thirsty, which mm-hmm. also makes sense in the context of that fasting naturesis because if you're excreting ester sodium from the body, you're also excreting extra water. This is similar to what happens also on a ketogenic diet. There's also a little bit of ketogenic diet induced naturesis or excretion of sodium. And so I know people on those diets often have to consume more sodium and more water. So we think there's a little bit, but a smaller type effect with intermittent fasting. Okay. So perhaps if, if someone's doing this, be conscious of your hydration. Correct. Um, so how would you summarize this, everything we've spoken about? someone sits down with you and says, just give me one or two lines. What are the biggest takeaways from this that you want people to walk away with? Yeah. So I would say we found pretty clear data that the time of day and the fasting duration, one of these two or both of these two affects your body weight or affects how much weight you can lose. And that basically if you do intermittent fasting um, by eating early in the day, it will help you lose more weight and it'll lower your blood pressure. The other thing we haven't quite covered yet is also the effects on mood. We also looked at mood in this study, and we asked people about their energy levels, feelings of depression and dejection. Um, We also asked them about anxiety, anger, tension, etc. And we found um, that people reported greater improvements in mood with the early time-restricted eating. So they reported greater energy levels, fewer feelings of depression and dejection. less fatigue and inertia, and uh, just a better overall mood. So that was pretty exciting to us because it was, to my knowledge, that's the first study on intermittent fasting, to first randomized controlled trial of intermittent fasting to report improvements in mood. Okay, amazing. It's really interesting. If, if someone's uh, listening to this and thinking, very cool study, um, early time restricted eating, um, right. sounds like something that I might try, but they heard us speak about the study design and they, they, mm-hmm. they're not so keen on counting calories. And, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, I think there's many people out there that have tried it. They think it's, it's mundane. Um, it, it perhaps uh, is putting too much focus on food all day. It's a lot to think mm-hmm. about, um, especially right. if you're a busy person yes. with kids and yes. a job. Um, it's, a, it's just an extra task and and we only have so much bandwidth. So um, I guess that person might be considering, well, is there any benefit to me doing the early time restricted eating if I'm also not counting calories? Will will there still be an advantage for me in terms of um, my body weight and my metabolic health? Yeah, absolutely. The vast so we're up to over just over 50 clinical trials on time restricted eating in humans. And if you look at what are called meta-analyses, so these are um, sort of where you lump together the results from all the studies and you see, is there weight loss benefit? Almost all these studies have participants not count calories. And if you look at the net effect across all studies, there is a benefit for weight loss. Um, And just for context, about half of clinical trials on time-restricted eating report a weight loss benefit. The other half don't. But when you pull all the results together, there is a net benefit for weight loss. And most Mm -hmm. of these studies um, don't have participants count calories. So yes, absolutely. In fact, we think one of the big advantages of time-restricted eating is you don't have to count calories. You just count time on the clock. Way easier rule for most people, right? So for our studies, 
when I talk to other scientists, they're kind of blown away by how little instruction we have to give people, right? Like if you came in and tried to get someone to eat a healthy diet, like a Mediterranean diet, low carb diet, you know, you name it. There's a lot of food education that goes into that, right? And there can be financial barriers to people mm. and logistical barriers. Like I got to come home from work and cook a, you cook a meal and then you may have to make trade-offs. Like am I spending time with my family or, or am I not? But with time-restricted eating and most forms of intermittent fasting, it's a timing rule. So then it just becomes for, I think, your listeners, do I want to try this or do I not? I think a lot of that is, one, I'd say there are lots of meal timing approaches out there. But second, a lot of the figuring out whether you can do it is just your schedule, right? So you might be listening to me and think, well, early time restricted eating is not for me. So what should I try instead? And I have two responses for that. So I'll tell you, most of our participants in the study did not want to do early time restricted eating. They wanted the benefit of the free weight loss program that we gave them. But mm. after they completed the study and tried it out, 42% of people wanted to continue with it. Mm. And the really interesting thing is the people who sticked with it were the ones who got the biggest benefit in their energy levels, right? So we think that some of these benefits may offset some of the time inconveniences. Obviously, this is a super personal decision, right? Some person, some people might say, like, I just have to have dinner with my family. My husband gets home at, you know, sure. 7 p.m. What do I do, right? So there are other approaches. So one is you could follow the old adage of eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and, and uh, dinner like a pauper. Or there's some data suggesting that doing time-restricted eating by skipping breakfast and eating in the middle of the day still has a, has a number of benefits, just not as many. So two larger clinical trials came out earlier this year comparing early versus later in the day time-restricted eating. One of those clinical trials found greater benefits for weight loss for early time-restricted eating, greater benefits for blood sugar control, for the gut microbiota, and for inflammation. So early in the day was better. The other group also found early in the day was better for many, for many of the same health outcomes, but there were some differences. So the second study, weight loss was about the same, whether you did early versus middle of the day, time-restricted eating, um, but there were still better benefit, greater benefits for blood sugar control um, and blood pressure with eating earlier in the day. But the punchline is there still seem to be some benefits from eating in the middle of the day. So that could be another approach for people. Sure. So, you, I mean... It's a great point that you make that the the kind of education aspect of this, there's a lot lot less barrier to entry to kind of understand the concept. Correct. The bigger barrier is how do you integrate this into your lifestyle with your schedule and make it sustainable. Um, and we kind of spoke earlier, but do you think there would still be benefits to say incorporating this early time restricted eating Monday to Friday, I'm thinking of the socialite here, and then on Saturday, Sunday, yeah. eating eating across however many hours. Um, yeah. Do you think that yeah. would still still lead yeah. to a kind of net benefit over time? Yeah, great question. Uh, I'll answer this question in two ways. So one, data from animal studies suggests that if animals practice time-restricted eating five out of seven days a week, they still get a lot of the same benefits. Not to the same degree, but they're still getting benefits. And then recently, for the same study that you saw published in JAMA Internal Medicine from my lab, we did what was called a per-protocol analysis, where we looked at people who consistently stuck with early time-restricted eating five days a week every week. And we found among these individuals, they, had, they lost more weight, uh, they had better blood sugar control, um, they had um, lower heart rates and they had greater improvements in mood. Um, the other really cool, interesting thing uh, is they slept less. And at okay. first we were a little worried about this, right? <laughs> Normally if people sleep less, you think that's a bad thing. Mm. But what was really fascinating is they also reported greater energy levels. Mm. So I'm now wondering if they have less of a need for sleep with their early time restricted eating because there's either better sleep consolidation or there's just a longer time to repest, repair, rest and repair before sleep. And so therefore they're sleeping less. And so now I'm super fascinated about the effects on sleep and see, trying to understand what that really mm. means. You just got the attention of all of the the workaholics <laughs> sleep sleep when you're dead. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So we don't know for certain that this is a benefit yet, right? Could be something negative because generally we assume that. But okay. if if this is a true, genuine benefit, and other people, other researchers find the same thing, I think it would be huge. And the benefit in our study was about thirty minutes. What would be interesting there is to look not just at the sleep quantity, but also the quality. Is it affecting? Correct. 
Is it yeah. is it uh, in some ways enhancing sleep quality? Um, right. Very interesting. Let's change gears slightly here. I want to learn uh, a little bit about your your work and look into night shift workers. Uh, I get yeah. a, a lot of folks messaging me who uh, work overnight. Perhaps they are yes. nurses. I, I understand that was one of the populations that right. you looked at. Um, interested in, okay, I'm I'm actually awake overnight, so not a typical day for a human. How how should I be setting up my meal timing? Is it am I eating? overnight during that shift? Am I eating sort of earlier in the day? Do I eat right before right. I go to bed? Um, and I know that you were recently involved in this study. I believe it was cross-sectional. I'll let you kind of explain mm-hmm. what it was. Um, but yeah, t- t- tell us about the rationale for that study with nurses and and what you found. Sure. So we did a cross-sectional study looking at nurses and nurses who work the night shift versus nurses who work the day shift. And quite strikingly, we found that nurses who work the night shift have about, at least in our study, they had twofold higher insulin levels, as well as way higher leptin levels. That indicates they're having problems with um, blood sugar metabolism, and also their appetite is sort of out of whack, so to speak. Um, In this particular study, we didn't test time-restricted eating. However, one of my good friends and colleagues, Frank Shear at Harvard, just came out with a phenomenal study this year looking into exactly this question. Because the big question for people who work the night shift is we know their circadian rhythms are different. Often their circadian rhythms are weaker, and they're also effectively in the wrong time zone, right? Because they're kind of used to being, you know, making uh, people alert at night. And so the big question is, do you eat on your night shift when it's dark outside, or is it better to eat during the daytime? So they did a study where they took people who, who didn't normally work the, the night shift, but they put them on a night shift, and then they had them. It was a cro- what we call a crossover study, so meaning they tried both eating during the night shift as well as eating um, during the daytime, and their blood sugar control was actually better when they ate during the daytime. So probably it's better for night shift workers to eat during the daytime when the sun is out. But we don't know for certain yet because that particular study didn't use people who habitually work the night shift, if that makes sense. Um, So, but it it suggests that it may be better for them to eat during the daytime. So until there's there's kind of more research there, if we think about how someone may structure their sleep that's working night shift, and let's say that they're working at, Mm -hmm. I don't know, 10 p.m., to 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. type shift, something like that. Right. And so they, they finish work at 6 a.m., they get home, sort of 7, 8 a.m., they're at home. It's now daylight, but they're, they're going to actually go to bed soon. So mm-hmm. right. are they, would it be, would that be the optimal time to get a lot of calories in um, right before they're about to go to sleep? Or would they, would it be better to sort of shift that back, go to sleep? perhaps with less calories or um, certain types of nutrients, perhaps the, perhaps there's a certain mm-hmm. type of meal makeup that might be best then. Um, and I'm just throwing ideas out there. And then eating more of their calories when they wake up at 3 p.m. or whatever it is between that that period where it's still light outside before they go back to work. Yeah. So the, the data from Frank Shear's group suggests that they should eat right before they go to sleep. So say they come off their night shift at around 7 a.m. in the morning, they should eat right then, go okay. to sleep, and then eat again when they wake up. Mm-hmm. Okay. And is there any? has anyone looked at um, the sort of nutrient makeup of those meals and whether there, there's a difference? I'm just thinking if, if glucose metabolism is impaired, if at a certain mm-hmm. time... Uh, it may yes. make more sense to have a kind of yeah. higher fat, high protein high meal. Fat diet, yeah. No one's looked at that yet, unfortunately. Okay. We're kind of on the early early stages of research for this field. Right. Is it a space where there is a lot of groups researching it? Do you expect more research to sort of come out to help um, better understand uh, yeah. meal timing, sort of optimization for, for shift workers? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my collaborators at um, University of Colorado is studying whether time-restricted eating can negate some of the negative side effects of shift work. So Mm -hmm. there's a fair amount of activity in the field, but a lot of the studies have just started or they're ongoing. So we don't have the results yet. Okay. Well, that's some good information, at least for now. I think a a lot of night shift workers probably are grazing overnight. Um, So at least this provides some preliminary information to to perhaps make some improvements in the meantime until Mm -hmm. there's more data there. Um, 
You mentioned in email to me that you were also interested in time restricted eating and cancer. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm curious: is this something that your when and the field is looking at in terms of cancer prevention, or is it a sort of adjunct or, or alternative therapy for people with certain types of cancer? Correct. We're looking at it as an adjunct. So, meaning, if you take people who have cancer, can we imp- improve their abilities? Uh, to basically beat the cancer and or reduce the mm-hmm. side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. Okay. And w- what evidence do we have around time-restricted eating or like shortening windows? And mm-hmm. uh, like, is there any observational yeah. evidence, for example, that people who eat over a shortened period of the day have lower risk of getting a cancer or lower risk of recurrence of a, of a cancer? Yeah. Is there any data there? Yeah. So there's some data. So there's some cross-sectional data and some data from randomized clinical trials. So there's some cross-sectional data suggesting that those who eat over an I think it's 11 hour or shorter time window have I think it was a 36 percent reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence. Um, so there was some data suggesting effects on preventing cancer. And uh, recently, there have been, there have been a couple of clinical trials in this area too. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory because it's super fascinating and it doesn't often come up when you hear about intermittent fasting. So Walter Longo, I have to give him a huge shout out. He's done a lot of really important work in this area, but he's really pioneered something called the differential stress sensitization theory. And it's this basic concept that if you fast cells, healthy cells, Prior to chemotherapy and radiation, so before chemotherapy and radiation starts, it causes the healthy cells to go in this self-protective mode where they upregulate their antioxidant defenses and so forth because they're, they're kind of like, oh, no, there are not a lot of nutrients or growth factors around. Let me kind of go into this self-preservation mode. So then when chemotherapy and radiation come along, those cells are be- better with, able to withstand the negative effects of chemotherapy and radiation. And so they actually die at a lower rate. Conversely, um, tumor cells, because they have what are called oncogenic mutations, so they have these alterations in their DNA, they have, they're like rapidly growing and dividing, right? That's what cancer does. And as a result of these mutations, they actually can't activate these same self-protective pathways. And as a result, when they are fasted, they actually have to rely on different um, fuel to fuel their rapid growth. And so the fuel that they rely on actually produces more molecular damage, more free radicals. So they actually end up dying at a higher rate. And so what's super cool in these animal studies is if you fast animals prior to chemotherapy and radiation, you boost the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation dramatically. But if you fast them after they start chemotherapy and radiation or after they're done with chemotherapy and radiation, you don't get the same benefit. So you can actually enhance the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation while reducing side effects. So we actually have a clinical trial right now in patients with rectal cancer where we're trying to test this differential stress sensitization theory in humans. And what we're hypothesizing we'll see is if you, um, is with the time, we're again testing early time-restricted eating with more more leniency than in our other studies, but still an eight-hour window. But if you test early time-restricted eating, we're testing whether it can reduce the negative side effects in chemother- of chemotherapy and radiation, right? There's a lot of nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness, hair loss. Can we reduce some of those nasty side effects, but also boost someone's chances of actually beating the cancer? So in other words, can we shrink the tumor? Right. And so is that that's a, a, a randomized controlled trial or what's the study design there? That's correct. Randomized controlled trial in 300 patients. It's a two-site clinical trial. One site is here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where I work, and the other is at Cedar sinai Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in the Los Angeles area. So everyone is going through sort of standard cancer treatment, pharmacotherapy, and then correct. some of these participants are given a restricted um, eating mm-hmm. window intervention correct. on top of that. And so the, the idea with the adverse effects is, does that go back to what you said earlier around it's possible that this fasting sort of builds resilience in healthy cells? Correct, exactly. That is exactly the concept. And some people will even call this hormesis, if you've heard the, the term before, this idea that a little bit of injury kind of 
um, increases your body's ability to be resilient or more resilient in the long term. Mm. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Is it is it possible that say the protocol for uh, uh, an eating window for someone with cancer and preventing cancer recurrence mm-hmm. is different to everything we've been talking about with regards to mm-hmm. average person wanting to maybe shed a few kilograms and improve their metabolic health. Absolutely. In fact, there was one study suggesting that certain forms of intermittent fasting may be worse for cancer. Mm. So there was a cool study done in animals where they, um, they had the animals either cut their calories every day or they cut their calories by a more dramatic amount on some days and by a less dramatic amount on other days. So it just, you know, it was um, kind of an inter- what we call intermittent energy restriction. So they didn't restrict their calories every day. And in that case, um, daily cutting of calories was better for slowing the growth of tumors. So timing may matter in different ways for different conditions, which makes this super interesting. And I, I, there's also a unique challenge with cancer patients, right? A lot of them have trouble eating because of all the side effects, right? So we may find that it's intermittent fasting may not be very doable. Um, Walter Longo, when he developed his fasting mimicking diet, he was finding that only about a quarter of patients were willing to fast for 48 hours uh, prior to chemotherapy and radiation. So that's how we got motivated to look at other intermittent fasting approaches rather than just looking at fasting, water-only fasting per se. So where's the, the field, I guess, at oncology in terms of applying this knowledge? Is, is right now, is it yeah. a, a sort of more of a level of uh, early excitement and, and hope and there's not really any specific protocols that you could give a, a patient? That's correct. We don't have protocols yet. So we've had, in the last two years, we've had explosion of interest in this area. And in fact, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. actually put out a call for proposals to study intermittent fasting in cancer patients. And our, ours was one of the ones that got funded. Um, so we don't have the data yet, but the trials are starting to come out. But I can say there are two trials that I know of that are starting to find some suggestive benefits um, of intermittent fasting on cancer. Neither of them tested time-restricted eating. They tested other forms of intermittent fasting, but one of them tested what's called the fasting-mimicking diet, where you eat a very low-calorie diet, so typically about 800 calories for three to five days in advance of every chemotherapy infusion. And they found, um, when they looked at the cells from the tumor, they found evidence that it was less um, progressed, so to speak. So um, and they found um, some evidence of more uh, remission, cancer remission. It wasn't a slam dunk in the study. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just didn't have the sample size for that. But there was some evidence that, they, that this differential stress sensitization theory would, might be true. Super interesting. I have uh, I have Volta Longo scheduled in to to come on the show in uh, I think about a month's time. So um, I'm sure that that might come up in our conversation. That'd be a fantastic topic. He's really the expert. So yeah. was there anything on on the cancer side of things or earlier topics that we discussed before we kind of close this one out that you feel like we missed and and that you kind of perhaps wanted to add? We've also, in some of our studies, I mean, one of the things I get asked about a lot is, do you see any sort of rejuvenative effects on the body, right? And so we have, in some of our other studies, found that time-restricted eating increases genes associated with autophagy. And we've also found that it upregulates a particular gene called CERT1, which is famous for being known as the longevity gene. And we also find a lot of changes in antioxidant defense systems and in circadian gene expression. So it looks like there's a lot of like cellular reprogramming along the lines of regeneration. And we just got funded to do a large study to see if intermittent fasting um, is as effective or can be effective for slowing the aging process in humans. So we're super, super excited about that. How do you go about teasing that the the sort of independent effects, and I'm sure you can, you've can you thought about mm-hmm. this with study design, of course, yes. has been much made of yeah. calorie restriction and, and the, the benefit yes. of calorie restriction um, in, in lots of different sort of animal models for improving lifespan um, sort of across the board. How do you tease that out if you're looking at a time-restricted eating intervention that also causes yeah. weight loss? 
Yeah, in our particular study, we aren't, we won't be able to answer that question, but there's some other researchers who are looking at mm-hmm. that. So Leonie Helbron right now, I think, has a trial like answering exactly that question. And she's she's in Australia too. So she does some okay. great work in this area. But generally what we do from a study, what we call a study design perspective, is we would have at least one group, one group that practiced time restricted eating and didn't lose weight, and then we'd look at the effects. But my lab has done a number of these really well controlled studies where we don't allow participants to lose weight and we still find benefits. So we think mm-hmm. there's still a lot of benefits there. Um, right. Probably mo- most of them are driven by weight loss. We still find at least with the early time restricted eating, there are benefits even if you don't lose weight. Amazing. Courtney, this has been another fantastic, super informative uh, episode. Thank you so much for, for making time yeah. to do this and, and thank you for, for all that you do. It's really cool to have scientists come on the show and discuss their research at such a, a detailed level, but then to be able to, to give people tools mm-hmm. and um, things that they can implement potentially hopefully yeah. starting today that can improve their health and, and quality of life. So uh, a big thank you from all of us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's always always fun to talk about this stuff. And the reason why I'm and other scientists are so passionate is just because it makes a big difference in people's lives. Awesome. Thank you, very thank, much. you. thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.